Good afternoon. Welcome to the Fig Security Smart Income Investment Strategies webinar. My name is Elizabeth Moran and I'm Director of Education and Research at FIG. Today I have with me Craig Swanger, our Senior Economist. Now Craig has over 20 years in finance, uh, including 15 at Macquarie where he was Chief Investment Officer. He spent a lot of time around the world uh, in wealth management. We're very delighted to have him here today. So without further ado, and I'm really going to hand over to Craig now because I'm tongue-tied at the start of the seminar, which isn't good, but Craig, welcome. Thank you for being with us here today. Thanks, Liz. Um, so as per the introduction, um, I've been in investment markets for, for 20 years and um, when I was at Macquarie in particular, had clients uh, from uh, you know, India, for example, where we would do seminars, there'd be five or 6,000 people in a room. Um, and, and so-called mum and dad investors all the way through to some of the world's largest pension funds um, in Europe and endowments um, in the US, very sophisticated investors through to normal people. And the questions were always the same. And whenever we got to one of these points in the cycle, uh, the, the um, LTCM crisis in 98, the, the dot-com um, bust in 2000, um, then we had 2007 and then we had 2009. So we had one crisis after another, the question's the same every single time. Is this time different? And you know, real investors ask the question, um, the media and, um, and Wall Street will tend to try and answer the question by saying this time is different. Um, and you know, in my experience, it's never been different and it's not different this time. Uh, it's a different excuse, but there's one thing that, that um, persistently drives all sorts of investment markets whether you're talking uh, about equities or currency or commodities uh, or property or even bonds, um, fear and greed are the things that change prices on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we always talk to investors, particularly when we're talking about the more conservative part of your port portfolio being you know, cash and bonds, that you really need to, your investment plan really needs to be based on taking a step back and looking at the fundamental drivers of real asset value. Try and figure out what assets you want to have, what investments you want to have in your portfolio because you believe that they are fundamentally strong, secure assets that are going to deliver what you need from that part of your portfolio. Um, so if it's, if it's for growth, then you're buying into a share that you think has got some upside. If it's for income, then you believe that you're going to get that income on a reliable basis um, year in, year out. So there's some assets, for example, that I, I personally just won't invest in because I just really struggle to understand how I can value them on a fundamental basis or I just don't like them no matter what the price is. Um, you know, gold, for example, is really hard to figure out what its real value is. Um, it's used for jewellery and that can set some sort of a price, but actually it's more traded as, as, a, uh, as a hedge. It doesn't have a, a fundamental value. Um, Chinese equities is another good example where it doesn't matter what the price is. I'm not buying that asset. Um, and that's a personal bias just around not really having a lot of faith in the, in the transparency um, of the market. Um, so no matter what the price is, I don't believe in the fundamentals, so they're not going in my portfolio. Um, so that's the first question. Then the second question is around price, and that's what greed and fear drive. So only if I like the asset based on fundamentals, then I'll look at the price and try and determine whether or not the cycle we're going through right now, the, the level of the price right now, um, means I should be buying it. So I like, for example, um, Sydney property. But I don't like Sydney property right now because it's too high a price. Um, whereas gold and Chinese equities, it doesn't matter what the price is, I'm not buying. So that's the starting point for when, when I do these seminars, regardless of who I'm talking to or, or meetings, um, is you know, we're here to talk about fundamental drivers of asset value not what the market's going to do in the next 10 minutes or the next day or the next week. Um, that's called day trading and the other one's called investing. So a lot of the uh, presentation today is about um, investment strategies and it makes an assumption that whether you've actually written it down or not, you have an investment plan right now. And most people, if they're honest, they'd say, well, I haven't ever written down my investment plan, but I've got an idea of what I'm doing and what I like and what I'm investing in. So we're assuming that You've got a plan. Um, and so what we're going to talk about today really is the five biggest risks that we see to Australian investors that um, give you cause to ask, how would my investments and my plan go should these risks 
come to fruition? What can I do with my portfolio to create a bit of a buffer or some protection to make sure if this risk was to come true, then I wouldn't be as impacted. My lifestyle wouldn't be as impacted. I wouldn't lose as much of my wealth. I wouldn't have as much stress. Um, or alternatively, on the flip side of that risk, there's usually an opportunity. What can I do in order to be able to profit from that risk? So all the media at the moment um, talking about the, the fear and greed cycle, um, it's meaningful. You know, anyone who tells you it's not um, you know, timing the market, it's all about time in the market, it's only half true. It's meaningful to watch the markets and, and how they go up and down, but it's really about finding the right time to buy or, or sell the assets that you fundamentally like. You've got to like them first. Um, so I'm going to go through five different risks. I'm going to start from uh, out of those five, the one that I think is the least risky, um, the, the least impactful for Australian investors. By the time I get to the uh, number three on the list, I'm going to then start talking about some specific asset allocation themes. Now, despite the fact that this is a FIG presentation, um, we're not just going to talk about bonds. We're going to talk about uh, all asset classes, your overall asset allocation, um, because frankly, talking about bonds for one hour is really hard work. So we're going to give you a broader context to talk about, and but with a real focus on income producing assets. And obviously, because we're talking about income producing assets, we're going to, we will talk about bonds quite a lot. Uh, I'm going to try and keep it to um, the allotted hour. Uh, as Liz said, you know, there's a lot of people online with a lot of questions. So we'll try and jump in from time to time and answer some of those questions. But if you hear me start to um, pick up the speed towards the end, it's because I'm trying to keep you on your time schedules um, and wrap this up in, in one hour. So um, there's a really small font disclaimer there that um, you know, if you want to see that, that's on our website as well. Let's get into it. The number five risk, um, and this is all about obviously the uh, EU breakup. So with each of these risks, I'm going to talk about three components of risk and talk about the impact on Australians were this risk to come to fruition. And I'm talking about Australian investors here in general. Um, most of us have some assets overseas. Most Australian companies these days are dependent on the global economy. Um, but if you, you know, there might be some exceptions of people who are only invested in TDs, in which case, uh, sorry, term deposits, in which case you may not be impacted. So I'm talking about the average Australian. Um, and in this case, I'm saying were the EU to break up, the impact on Australians would be minor. As an investor, the impact would be something but minor. Uh, I'm going to talk about the probability with each of these risks. And in the case of the EU breaking up, it's small, but it's going the wrong way. It's a growing risk. Um, and I'm going to talk about the time frame uh, being long term. So if something has a high impact, a high probability and an immediate time frame, that's the biggest risk we can get. And you'll see as I go towards number one that um, those all start to step up. Over the last few months, we've heard a lot about Greece. And it, was, it seems strange to talk so much about a country that, that has an economy um, you know, roughly the size of the Victorian, the Victorian economy um, in the context of being such a global issue. Greece is not about Greece. The issue with the EU um, that we've seen for the last few months is not about Greece. The issue is the way that the two powerhouses of the EU, Germany and France, dealt with the Greek issue. And the way that you know, so the Germans on one hand wanted to punish the Greeks for um, spending too much, not being um, sensible with their fiscal budget. And the French wanted to say, well, but you're part of the EU, so we need to look after you. And they bickered for so long that the result was actually worse than some of the deals that have been put on the table along the way. So if you remember, the Greeks actually voted on one of the austerity packages, um, rejected it. But then the one that they wound up with in the end was worse. So all they've really done with the final agreement is pretty much ensured that Greece will eventually wind up with a major issue, if not a default, because they've created such um, tight austerity measures around what the government can spend and increase taxes that the economy is almost certainly going to flatline or get worse, and they'll never be able to collect enough money to balance the budget. So eventually there will be a problem. It's a relatively small problem because it's Greece. But as I say, the issue is the fact that the EU couldn't even deal with that. So what happens if it happens again? What happens if we see a bigger economy 
go back to the same table and France and Germany have to deal with that again. Um, and we have a, a repeat. So on this chart, we've got the um, debt to GDP ratios for a number of countries. You might remember uh, a few years ago, we talked about the pigs. The pigs were um, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain. And they were the five countries that had the worst debt to GDP ratios. In other words, the size of the, the government debt relative to the size of the economy. And you don't want that number to be too far above 100% because after a while it starts to spiral out of control. So Greece is 177% um, at the time we did this chart, uh, a little bit higher now. Uh, but the change in the last eight years between the, the old pigs um, has been quite extraordinary. Ireland got on with the job of um, pulling off the proverbial band-aid, wore some pain, property prices collapsed, they changed their tax regime, they pulled in um, fiscal spending, and they've got that number down to around 100%. They've got it under control and heading in the right direction. In fact, GDP um, growth, the economic growth in Ireland last year was 6%. Fantastic outcome. Um, Belgium's now showing up on the chart as being over 100, so that's a new one that wasn't in the pigs, heading the wrong way, but again, relatively small economy, so we're not that fussed about it. Spain has actually, um, again, much like Ireland, managed to get um, their debt situation under control. The economy is in ruins, mind you. If you're, if you're um, under 25, you've got an equal chance of being unemployed, 50% unemployment rate. But they've um, managed to balance their economy, so they will head in the right direction. Portugal, we've got up there as 130% gone nowhere, not getting better, not getting worse. Um, so we're not that worried about that one. Italy is the concern. Um, the Italian economy is large. Uh, it's the third largest economy in the EU after France and Germany. Were it to face um, serious uh, issues around its ability to repay its debt um, or a global recession uh, were to occur and Italy suffered even further drops um, in its tax revenue, uh, then we'd have a real problem. And if an economy the size of Italy were to slide uh, and be even, even be considered to be let go from the EU, then that's the end of the EU. Um, so all we really worry about with, with the EU is the breakup because you know, the impact on us uh, is it, it changes the world economy, it changes trade flows, it's going to hurt currency markets, and it causes a huge amount of volatility in equity markets. Uh, we're not worried about it right now. This is a long-term issue. But if you start to see Italian debt appear in the newspapers, initially it would be one mention and then two months later, another, and then another few weeks later, another, and then suddenly it becomes headline news like Greece, that's when you know that there's going to be an issue with the EU. Uh, and if it's Italy, it's going to be a big one. But as we say, uh, I think that's pretty small risk right now, um, and it's a long-term thing. It's not going to happen in 2015 or 16, if, if at all, it's 17 or 18. Okay, I've got a question uh, for you, Craig, from Rhett. He asks, given the high level of global debt, sovereign, corporate, and household, is any investment safe? Uh, yes, is the, sh is the short answer. Um, debt is not bad in, it, in itself. So looking at these um, debt to GDP ratios can be misleading. Japan has a much higher ratio. Um, last time I saw it, it was 190 something percent. But Japan is actually a relatively self-contained economy. Um, it runs a surplus on a current account basis. In other words, it has capital coming into the country. Um, and most of its pension funds are investing in its own country. So it owes money to itself. So we don't worry so much about that ratio. Uh, so long as debt is, you know, can be paid back and can be recovered and there's assets behind it and there's income, then debt's not a bad thing. No number is the wrong number. Uh, where you get concerned is um, where there's like, you know, if you're, if you're lending money to a friend or you're a bank uh, with you know, lending money on a mortgage basis or you're lending money to a country, the thing that concerns you in all three cases is are you lending money to a responsible borrower? And Greece was not responsible. No. So when you're talking about debt, you're really talking about bonds as well, aren't you? So yep. Bonds bond or term market. deposits. Or, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. So we go on to number four. Number four risk uh, for Australian investors is that the US economy stalls. And by stall, I mean that the you know, right now the US economy uh, is the powerhouse of the global economy. Um, you know, China is actually adding more value to the global economy than the US, but it's pretty volatile. And so what we really don't want to see is 
the US economy start to stall because that's really our, at the moment, um, the last great hope of the global economy. Um, every uh, week that goes past, the risk of the US economy stalling goes down. Every point of data that we see, and we're getting, um, we as an industry and, and as investors are getting pretty obsessive about it now um, because we want to see uh, the US economy continue to produce great data, and it is. Jobs data came out last week, strong. Consumer confidence comes out, strong. Business conditions, strong. It's, I think uh, Warren Buffett was quoted um, a couple of days ago saying, good, but not great. And that's the best way to describe the US economy right now. If it stalls, however, the impact on Australian investors is significant. The probability, I think, is small and probably falling. Uh, and so if it's going to happen, at any time in the next few years, it's going to happen immediately because, as I say, each week that goes past, the risk of this happening falls because the, it's just continuing to give us some, some uh, great outcomes. So, Craig, if um, the Fed um, increase interest rates, is that a, a chance in it that the economy may stall? Is that one of the things? Is that they're teetering on that? There's a lot of discussion. Will they, won't they, this month, December? Yeah. Can you give us your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, all, all of the... Um, chatter at the moment, it really comes down to two different issues. One, if they increase interest rates 25 points, 50 points, it doesn't really matter for the economy, save for one big issue, mm -hmm. and that one big issue is confidence. Mm -hmm. And the problem that the Fed now has, it's been so long, uh, the Fed just for everyone's information is short for the Federal Reserve, which is America's um, central bank like our Reserve Bank of Australia. The problem the Fed has right now is if they move, uh, part of the market is going to be shocked and part of the market's not going to be shocked. No matter what they do right now, thanks to the volatility created by China, um, no matter what they do, there's going to be volatility on equity markets. And equity markets are looking very, very nervous. So if there was a, a collapse caused by a relatively small issue, like the Federal Reserve increasing rates, um, then that goes straight to consumer confidence, which is actually the thing that's driving the economy so strongly. Mm -hmm. So they're sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place in that they have to increase rates at some stage. You can't leave them at zero, otherwise you have no um, bullets to fire in the case of a real recession coming down the track in a few years. But if they increase right now, they're going to shock the equity markets and that could um, stall the recovery. So that's something to watch for in the coming months. Yeah, that's right. So look, we, we don't fuss too much about whether it's September or December because as bond investors, we're really, we know it's going to increase and it's already priced into bond prices um, that there'll be several increases uh, in the Federal Reserve's uh, base interest rate. There were 10-year bonds in the States um, were 2.19% last night from a zero or a near zero cash rate. So in other words, markets are pricing in probably about 10% increases by the Federal Reserve over the next 10 years, if not more, not just one or two. So that's already priced in. Um, the, the issue that equity markets get very nervous about is, is it September or is it December? Because equity markets focus on the next 10 minutes, one hour, one day, one week. They're traders. So that creates a lot of noise and a lot of angst. Um, but we tell people to make sure, just keep an eye on, again, fundamentals, long term, you're investing in bonds, not because you want to trade them, but because you're looking for a, a long term income source. Um, and so really all this noise creates is an opportunity to jump in when when, when markets are um, going the wrong direction. Um, in, in this chart, I'm showing um, two different economic, uh, two, two different unemployment curves. So, and it's quite timely actually, because um, Australia's unemployment figure literally just came out. The media talks about unemployment um, uh, in the, when they talk about it, they talk about this, the blue line at the bottom of this chart. So you'll hear um, the global media talk about the US unemployment rate being 5.1%. Uh, um, and that's great. In, in historic terms, that's actually um, below average. So on that basis, the US economy is doing very well. So you ask the obvious question then, if it's doing that well, why would the Federal Reserve not be putting up rates? Because the headline rate, um, in this case, in America's case, 5.1, or in Australia's case, it just came out as a 6.2% measure, that's not the real unemployment rate. The real unemployment rate on this chart is the is the red line. And in America, they call that the U6, unemployment 6, doesn't stand for anything else. Um, U6 measures not just the people who are collecting an, an unemployment check, 
but those people who don't have as good a job as they would like. Uh, that's a layman's definition, but it really means if I'm working 10 hours a week and I'd rather work 20 hours a week, then I'm measured in U6, but not in U3. I'm in the red line, but not in the blue line. Um, if I'm working as, um, you know, let's say uh, a nurse and um, I'm doing shift work and I'm not guaranteed 40 hours a week and I want a permanent job, then I'm measured in the red line and not the blue line. Um, and so what the um, Federal Reserve is really looking at is that red line because they want to know that the economy is as productive as it could be. Um, think about it, if you owned a, a factory and you had 100 people working in that factory and 50 of them were working really well and the other 50 were prone to taking a few too many sickies and smokos, you're not happy because your factory is not at full productivity. They've got jobs, they're just not working as hard as they could. Uh, really, the Federal Reserve's job is looking after a factory, except that it's um, 150 million people instead of 100 people. And they want to know that people are working at their maximum productivity. Um, and so that's what they watch is the red line. And you know, at the moment, the U6 rate um, is still about 8.3%. And that's actually well above long-term averages. I'm sorry, 10.6%. They wanted to get it down to 8.6%. So it's still a long way above... Um, uh, long-term averages, and that's because while people have got jobs, they're not as good as what they want. And so you'll hear about um, you know real income being down. American household income is down over the last 10 years, and that's right. They're, 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 as a nation, they're earning less now than they did 10 years ago because their jobs aren't as good uh, or aren't as full-time as they were before. And there's no wage inflation, isn't that right as well? Aren't uh, wages fairly static and, right. and very low? And yeah, um, yeah that's it. and that's exactly the point the Fed is, is looking for. They watch wage inflation because, you know, an employer is only going to pay someone more money than they did yesterday if they're worried that that person won't take the job. Mm. Right? That's why you pay more money. And if there's plenty of other people out in the workforce who would love to work 40 hours instead of 20 hours, then they don't have to pay you more. They'll go and hire someone else instead, especially in the US with, with um, looser labor laws. So, you know, there's a long way to go before the Fed needs to worry about wage increases. And if they don't have to worry about wage increases, then they don't have to worry about inflation and therefore they don't have to worry about putting up interest rates. They will put up interest rates because as I said before, uh, when you're at zero, you've got no bullets to fire. You can't put them down. And if so if, if a downturn did come along, They've got nowhere to move, so they need to put them back up again to, to create some slack. But there's no rush at all. So this is just number four on our list. Um, its its impact would be significant. The probability, however, is small and falling. And if it's going to happen, it's going to happen soon, um, only because it's just getting better and better in the US. The only thing that could derail the US now, I think, um, is a major global recession. And obviously, the biggest risk to that is, is China, which we'll, we'll come back to. So on to number three, um, and so you know we're dealing here with risk to Australian investors. We love our property. Uh, what could be a bigger risk than a, a fall in the Australian housing market? This slide talks about an Australian housing market crash as being the risk. I don't like the word crash. Uh, I just, you know, it's hard to see that scenario. Um, but I do always qualify that statement by saying I'm the son of a Gold Coast property developer. So it's very hard, and as an Australian and with a natural bias to property, uh, it's it's almost impossible for me to imagine a scenario of housing crashing. I'm sure the Irish said the same before their Dublin housing market crash as well. But that's my qualification on it. I think the probability is still small. Um, but I do think the risk of uh, a decline or a flat line in Australian, Australian housing is growing quite quickly. Um, both Sydney, uh, sorry, both Melbourne and Brisbane um, are shifting from um, what's been quite a long period of having an undersupply of housing to um, now having an oversupply of housing. Not a major one, but it's gone through that line. And so there's now enough housing, which has been putting a lot of pressure on prices, uh, and that pressure will now be eased. Sydney's still got a couple of years of building to go before it catches up. Um, but uh, you know, in the event that there's not a, a um, some other reason for there to be an increase in demand for housing, um, an oversupply will see a big slowdown in housing market um, prices. And so were there to be a, a hit to the economy, then a correction is possible. 
So remembering that with all of these risks at the moment, where you know, if I was to put, um, I'll break the, the standard economist rule and actually put a number on one of these risks. Um, I think the risk of a housing market correction in Australia is still only about, say, 20%. Um, so it's a long way from being what we'd expect. So you look at this and you say, okay, it's a relatively low probability, not meaningless, 20% is still a number, but um, it's not the base case. So I'm not going to change my entire investment strategy um, to get ready for a housing market crash. I'm just going to think, okay, if this did happen, what would that do to my portfolio? What would that do to my income? What would do that do to the value of my assets, shares, property, uh, bonds, whatever, whatever else I'm holding? And is this something I can do to reduce the risks in my portfolio, or is there some way I can profit somehow from housing uh, pricing falling? In this case, actually, not very easy to, to, to profit from that. Um, so we're really talking about preparing yourself for that. Some people will think that there's a higher chance of a housing market crash or a correction in Australia. Many of you will, in which case you want to be um, thinking through the answers to those questions quite carefully. And others will be saying, no chance, so I'm just waiting for the next slide. That's the whole point of this discussion is figure out what it is you believe. Um, and then when we get to um, the next slide, we'll start talking about well, what could you do about that if you wanted to, um, uh, if you wanted to protect yourself or maybe even profit from this scenario. I know like some of the regional centres for property have had gone through some quite tough times. I was in Perth a couple of weeks ago and a gentleman was telling me about a property in Karratha that had been bought at the top of the cycle for $1.3 million and had just sold for 400000 So I guess there's going to be spots that don't do so well and others that will withstand uh, the market better. So maybe if you have uh, individual property investments, you might want to think about where they are and the chances of those those markets coming under some pressure. Yeah, and it, which is always the case with, I mean, that, it, that's a mining-related um, story, so it's always going to be the case with assets like that. Sadly, we can only really sort of deal with the big population bases, um, but it's, it's um, you know, thinking about housing market corrections, it's easy to go to property, but then there's a lot of other assets that will be impacted as well with that. And actually, one of the reasons for that is on this um, on this chart where we've shown um, the thick blue line is bank loans to investors in residential property. So not um, owner-occupied, but bank loans to investors in residential property as a percentage of the size of the economy. And we do that just to, you know, if we, if we did it as a dollar figure, that would be a very steep line. The Aussie economy has grown a lot in this 20-year period. Um, so, you know, what we really look at is compared to the size of the economy, um, are banks lending more or less to investors in resi property? And, you know, clearly the answer is more. It's five times more. So it's gone from 24% to nearly 120% um, in a 20-year period, uh, which is unhealthy. It's gone too far. There's been a lot of press on that already. Um, it's not the bank's fault. It's actually us as a collective investor. Um, Adding, adding a few extra um, um, overseas investors now as well. It's tax policy. It's There's a whole range of reasons. It's not about blame. It's just thinking about, well, if there was a downturn, uh, how do the banks look? How do the banks go if there's a major downturn in Aussie property? The good news is um, that, you know, and APRA, the banking regulator, has done a lot of testing on this, um, that you could see a 40% fall in Australian housing prices and the um, banks would still be safe. The share prices wouldn't look great, uh, the hybrids wouldn't look great, the bonds would be fine, and the term deposits would be fine. They would survive, which is what the banking regulator is looking for. 40% is um, a very unlikely scenario because Australia um, has immigration. It's a stable economy. Um, we think it's pretty bad right now, but we're still growing at 2% per annum, so it's not that bad. But the point is that um, don't go rushing down to your local branch and pulling out your money. Um, this doesn't mean the bank's going to be in trouble. It's just thinking about uh, if so much of the bank uh, profit comes from mortgages, if the default rate in mortgages does go up a little bit, it will have an impact on earnings growth and then therefore on, on bank shares. Um, I add the red line into this more for a, um, an opportunity to jump up on my soapbox. Uh, bank loans to small to medium enterprises, SMEs, um, in that same period of time has gone from 60% to um, to low 40s. So that's the real economy. That's where jobs come from. They're lending less to small businesses and more to um, investment property. Uh, it's got nothing at all to do with um, with bonds. Um, 
but I like to talk about that one because it annoys me. On this uh, risk, I'm going to start talking about what you can do about it. So um, asset allocation. So the, the one area that you could potentially profit from a fall in Aussie housing prices is actually by going short the Australian dollar. Um, currencies can be confusing. You don't go out and buy a short Australian dollar, but as an Australian, when you buy US dollars, by definition, you are short Australian dollars. You've chosen to sell your Australian dollars and buy US dollars. Um, so, you know, and the reason why that would be a profitable strategy in this scenario, were Australian housing uh, to fall, no other economy around the world, maybe other than New Zealand, um, would be impacted. The Australian economy would be the only economy really severely impacted by an Australian housing market crash. Um, and that would cause international markets to sell the Australian dollar. They would push down the Aussie dollar even further than what it is already. On top of that, the Reserve Bank would lower rates because clearly with a drop in the housing market, consumer confidence will be hit very hard and that means less spending, which means a slowdown in the economy. So they'll lower rates to try and boost that up. I think in this sort of scenario, if it's a correction or a crash, um, the Aussie could stand to lose 10 to 30% from its current levels. So in other words, low 60s all the way through to low 50s, um, depending on the severity of that crash, it's quite significant. And so if you're holding US dollars instead of Australian dollars in that scenario, you, then you profit by 10 to 30% on whatever you're holding in that currency. Um, the next asset allocation point is reduce Aussie equities. To be really clear, this does not mean reduce equities. It means reduce Aussie equities. No other market around the world is going to have any meaningful correction or response to Aussie housing falling. Um, unless it's driven by, say, a shock in China or somewhere else. But if, if Aussie housing um, were to go through a correction, it's going to be a local issue. So really, the only equities that are going to be impacted are those on our exchange. Clearly, the banks will be uh, pretty heavily impacted, but construction will take a hit. Consumer confidence will go down. So anyone who relies on consumer spending, um, those, those stocks will be hit as well. A general decline in the ASX um, of a pretty severe nature could be expected, depending again on how far the housing goes down. 20 to 50 percent is not um, unreasonable to expect. So where do you go? You go into international equities. Uh, were you to go into international equities unhedged, well then you're in foreign currency as well. So you've done the short Australian dollar and you've kept money in, in equities, presumably because you want growth. Um, alternatively, you buy into high quality credit in Australia. So you go for higher quality in this scenario because if housing falls, the Aussie economy slides, um, higher risk corporate bonds uh, will be at a greater risk of default in that scenario, still low but greater. So you'd be going for, uh, on the slide we talk about IG credit, which is investment grade credit. Um, it's a strong source of returns through a recession because default rates are still very, very low um, and fixed bonds. Fixed rate bonds climb um, when rates fall, so you're making a, a gain on the fact that um, the yields will fall. Uh, it's a no-brainer to say reduce um, bank equity exposure. What's less obvious is um, that hybrids are actually equity. Um, this is a whole uh, you know, webinar, seminar in itself, so I'll just make the very quick point that um, hybrids will trade in a downturn like equity. We saw that in 2008. Um, I think CBA hybrids fell about 30% and the shares were down 50%. They go down because there's a perceived increased risk that you'll be forced as a hybrid holder into equity, which is what can happen under um, the current um, types of, of hybrids. Um, and because actually the liquidity is very low, so if there's a lot of sellers, they, the prices drop quite a lot. Um, in fact, we've even seen that with Pearl 7 is now, I noticed um, today, trading below $90 because risk is off the table, as they say. Well, it's unbelievable the new Westpac hybrids um, on, on issue first day, down two and a half percent. You know that's that's shocking, really. You wouldn't think that you should buy an asset and on the first day it starts to trade, you lose two and a half percent value. You yeah. know that's how many coupons, and can you sell into that market at that price? Yeah, no, you, you can't. That's right. So that's what I mean. It trades like an equity. An IPO comes out and it's down two and a half percent. You go, okay, made a bad pick. I'll win next time because they can go up forty percent on float or down twenty percent. They can do anything. That's an equity, and so hybrids are nowhere near as risky as equities, but they're a lot riskier than bonds. For that reason, they do trade a lot. Not many people will have mezzanine debt, but I do mention it because 
almost all mezzanine debt, which really means somewhere between senior and equity, um, is to the property construction industry. Uh, you're the um, last person to be repaid if a builder were to go under and you'd lent the mezzanine debt. Um, you're the last one to be paid and you can almost guarantee in a downturn you won't get paid. Um, so if you've lent money to someone in, in property and the interest rate on that is, say, 15%, you're in mezzanine debt and not the place to be if the construction cycle suddenly ends. I've got a couple of questions, Craig, about property. Here's one from Steve. How does a level of 120% of GDP for residential property investors compare to comparable economies overseas? And he states, surely this is at the expense of small business, which brings real economic growth. Do you have any comment around that? Um, yes, excellent point. Uh, it's, it's very, very short. Uh, so uh, yeah, this is this is again my soapbox point. So, you know, um, small business lending um, in Australia is pretty woeful compared to the US and UK. Um, I blame the fact that it is so favourable from a tax point of view to invest in property. Plus, we love property. Mm -hmm. So we have a cultural bias and a tax bias um, that add up to a problem for our economy right now, particularly right now when big business, mining, um, is no longer booming. We actually need small business um, to be repositioned. How does 120% compare to other overseas markets? The data is really unreliable. Yeah. So every country collects this data differently. Yeah. Um, that said, there's been uh, almost as many articles written by international magazines like The Economist saying that the number is way too high as there have been articles written saying it's okay. So there's just so many different ways you can cut it. Um, and I can't even say, I'd love to be able to say, actually, I think it is too high. I just, I don't know if 120 is wrong. I just don't like 24% growing to 120 in 20 years. That doesn't feel healthy. No, so Russell's asking, can, can we explain what the 120% of GDP is? So, mm -hmm. so GDP in Australia is about um, $1.2 trillion or, or uh, $1.2 million, million. If um, uh, investment loans are 120% of that, we're saying it's about $1.5 trillion of investment lending um, in Australia. Yep. So many zeros that it gets very hard to count. So that's why they start going into ratios versus the size of the economy. Excellent. I've got a um, question from David and from Michael. They're both wanting to know what are some of the possible triggers for property price falls? Um, David's suggesting unemployment up, Chinese investor withdrawal. What, what mm. else could you perhaps suggest? Yeah, I, unemployment up isn't going to sneak up on us. It's not going to suddenly jump. So, yes, um, if you if you read the economics books and fundamentally that should be the reason why. And if you had a view that in the next 10 years Aussie unemployment was going to stick around the current levels, then Australian property is not a great place to be. But we're a very strange market, and this is what um, magazines like The Economist don't understand. Uh, people want to live in this country for obvious reasons. You know, we're sitting here in, in Melbourne today, looking out the window, and I can see about 50 kilometres out the window across the bay. It's fantastic. Um, and I dare say, you know, Sydney might even be better, but that's probably fairly controversial. So I won't say that. <laughs> I'm from Brisbane, so yeah, I'm just and, happy and to be in Melbourne. Brisbane's better good. again. So, yeah. you know, everyone wants to live here. Um, and you know, you can imagine if you've got a substantial amount of wealth in China, um, it, it's a bit of a no-brainer to have an exit plan. If you're dealing with a centrally controlled government, you want an exit plan. So no, uh, no surprise that a number of those people will be buying property as an exit plan here in Australia. Um, Sydney has seen that in a really big way in suburbs like Mossman in the east. Uh, it's not really driving up prices um, for the first home buyers, like the, a lot of accusations being flung around at the moment. It's driving prices up in more like the two to three million zone. Um, but it's real. And that migration um, is going to continue to prop up our economy. So long as we can manage it, um, and you know, people aren't hurt as a result of it, they don't lose their jobs, can, you know, or housing affordability doesn't get out of control, we are the lucky country from that point of view. Um, and you know, because the, 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 particularly the Chinese population is, is less favourable to moving to the US or Canada or New Zealand um, or England than they are to Australia. That's a good thing. Good for us. However, if there's a short-term shock, and what really worries me about the last couple of months is you know, there is a short-term shock to the middle class of China, uh, which, by the way, is 50 million people, um, when we talk about yeah, upper middle class, the people who can afford to buy Australian property. 
Um, they have lost substantial wealth in the downturn um, of their equities market and their confidence will be down. Um, if that takes the edge off um, unit buying, apartment buying in Sydney, Brisbane and Melbourne, that could be enough to trigger a bit of a downturn. It could just tip us over the edge um, and then we start to lose confidence and we start to, we, we, we stop buying property. And that's where you get a bit of a flat lining. But I think with migration being as strong as what it is and fundamentally no reason for that to change in the next 20 years, um, yeah, it'll be more like a flat lining or a minor downturn than a, than a crash. So Donald asks, um, you know, perhaps could you comment on listed property trusts and industrial property? Yeah, I like industrial property just because of the fundamentals. Um, listed property trusts are really tricky. Um, leverage is no longer as big a concern as it was, but, you know, with listed property trusts, you've got to look at two things. One, fundamentally, what am I buying? And two, what's the premium to net tangible assets? Mm -hmm. So $100 worth of property uh, once it's listed on the exchange could trade from anything from $60, in other words, great value, to $140, in other words, not very good value. And so you've got to watch that discount to NTA as well. Uh, at the moment, feels pretty good value, actually. Okay, great. Okay. So, you know, that, at an asset allocation point of view, that's, um, that's what we talk about, is the places to go in the, in the case of an Australian housing market downturn. Now I'm going to talk about, and I'll have two or three of these through the presentation, some specific bond portfolios um, that a lot of our clients are uh, engaging in right now. The more this market volatility occurs in equities and they're taking a, a sort of a longer term look at their overall wealth and how that's protected in these scenarios, the more we're having conversations about um, a portfolio construction um, strategy, which is great. And you know, they're the sort of conversations that um, obviously that we want to have. This is one that um, has proven um, very popular with our more conservative clients. Infrastructure bond portfolio. Um, so before I get into what's on the left-hand side, I want to talk about the chart on the right-hand side. Uh, why this strategy? Infrastructure, which is basically anything um, that is a you know, fundamental requirement for an economy to run. If we didn't have roads, our economy doesn't work. If we didn't have trains or airports or power or water, our economy doesn't work. Um, you know, we can actually do without restaurants, things will go on. Won't be as fun, but things will go on. But, but um, airports we can't do without. So, you know, infrastructure tends to perform very well in a recession. Um, on this chart I've used the US for data because actually they had a severe recession very recently. So what I've done is compared activity between 2007 and 2009 on a range of different parts of the economy. So if I'm talking about activity in water, which is the left hand most bar, um, that's litres of water. How much water did people use in 2007 compared to 2009? Um, and it's actually gone up. People use more water in the recession than they did prior to the recession. I think that's uh, probably something to do with the fact that agriculture um, in a big way picked up. When the US dollar fell, um, agriculture um, in the US picked up and they started exporting a lot of food to China. So that's probably got a lot to do with it. But the point is, it barely moved. It's up 1%. Um, miles driven. How many kilometres did, did cars and trucks and motorbikes and so on do on roads in a recession? It also has barely moved. It was down 4%. You would expect it to be down a lot more than that, but most people were still working. Goods still needed to be transported across the country. Um, and if you're not working, you're looking for a job and you've still got to take the kids to school. Life goes on. So if you own a road and it collects money on a toll basis, or you own water pipes which collects money for every litre that's used, you're barely impacted by the recession. Electricity, more or less the same thing. I'll skip over groceries and come back to that. Um, health, that's, that's also infrastructure. Um, other than things like, say, cosmetic surgery, the health industry is barely impacted by a recession. You need to go to the doctor, it doesn't change anything. Um, Implainments is a fancy word for getting on a plane. Uh, that was impacted more, it's down 7% because there's some discretionary travel like holidays. Uh, but again, most of the economy continues on, people continue to get on planes and airlines tend to discount in a recession. So if you own the airport, you tend to do pretty well during a recession anyway, you're not that fussed. Um, but then we jump to something like, say, clothing, um, which is the bar sort of in the middle, a little larger than the others, down 13%. So you need clothing still, but you, there's a discretionary item that you're not going to buy um, and that you'll, or you'll buy less of in a recession. So if you own 
a um, clothing manufacturer or a retail outlet, you'll do much worse in a recession. Construction and lending, in other words, banks, finance, um, were the most severely impacted out of any of these categories, down 33%. So if you own one of those um, in a recession, then you've done very poorly. So this chart it describes why we like infrastructure assets um, in economic downturns. I've used the recession because it creates a better looking chart. It describes the extreme. I'm not using recession as a word because I think that's where Australia is heading, because I don't. Uh, but in a downturn, which is um, what we're, we would certainly see in a housing market correction, uh, infrastructure assets will do much, much better than the general economic uh, assets. Certainly shows how protective they can be of your cash flows if you're buying into infrastructure bonds, mm. because obviously they keep earning, the cash flow keeps coming in, they can keep paying you. So exactly. per, perfect uh, for, for to try and recession-proof your portfolio. Exactly. Yeah. And in fact, the same applies to the equities. Um, which we come to in a later slide, mm -hmm. but infrastructure equities are much lower risk in this sort of environment than um, than yeah, commodity equities or bank equities or retail equities. We like infrastructure um, because you know well right now in Australia, in fact, you can um, you know, can combine uh, capital index bonds and index annuity bonds, two different type of an, um, infrastructure bonds. Um, in a in a there's a great strategy that uh, Ryan Poff and many will follow has put together um, that when you put those two together, you're getting really good value in terms of the return you're getting, um, and you're still sitting with investment grade, um, in other words, triple B, single A, double A, triple A assets um, with your portfolio. Lower volatility, revenue drivers underneath, high quality investment grade bonds, no reliance on, on corporate earnings, like construction and finance and restaurants and so on. Um, basically, no reliance on Chinese growth. Um, even Chinese tourism numbers barely make an impact on Sydney Airport. Um, and if the Aussie dollar continues to fall, those numbers go up anyway. So, um, and very strong relative value right now because um, you know the, the uh, typical fund manager you know, doesn't tend to buy into infrastructure bonds because it doesn't suit their mandate. Not because they don't like them, but just they've got a mandate that doesn't allow them to buy it. So, you get good strong value for those for those bonds right now. I have a quick question from Helen, and she wants to know: Does education factor as infrastructure? Definitely, that's a that's a great example of infrastructure. Our economy cannot operate without education. We might last a day or a week or a month, but not much longer. We have to continue to, to educate children and adults regardless. And isn't it our third export, biggest export earner? Yeah, um, yeah for a while it was second. Okay. That's right. Yeah, it's, um, it's a fantastic export earner as well. So um, that's more at the um, discretionary end, and that will go up and down depending on how the rest of the world's doing. In an Australian market downturn where the rest of the world's doing well, education is a brilliant place to hide because a dollar goes down, that means that there's, but the Chinese economy and US economy, Asian economies haven't been hurt as much, so they come here to get educated. It's cheaper. Um, you now, we mentioned um, uh, infrastructure equity. On this slide, I just wanted to, to touch on a, um, on a common misunderstanding around investing, and I, I guess I talked a lot about this at the start. Understand what assets you want to buy because you believe in their fundamental drivers of their earnings. You, you understand what it is about this property, farm, airport, share, company, whatever, um, that is going to mean that you're going to get what you need out of it, either growth or income. Um, so that's called substance. And so substance over form is a, is a buffered expression, but um, it's a way of describing that, you know, invest in substance, not form. If you like Sydney Airport, There'll be times at which buying Sydney Airport shares will make more sense than buying Sydney Airport bonds. And there'll be times in which it makes more sense to buy the bonds, not the shares. If your outlook is for more risk rather than less, in other words, you think the world is getting riskier, you shift to bonds. If your outlook is for more growth, the world is heading into a growth period, you buy the shares. If everyone rushes into the bonds and they suddenly become expensive, then wait or buy the shares. It's a horses for courses argument. But the point is you've done the hard work to understand what Sydney Airport does and why it's going to keep making money and it's an infrastructure asset. Once you've done that hard work, you've got three different options in Australia. Buy the shares or there's two different bonds. In fact, there's a number of other bonds as well that is harder to find, but there's at least three options that you can find um, that you can buy into Sydney Airport. Um, Qantas is another great example. If we're keeping on this theme, um, Qantas is far more impacted in a recession um, for its shares than it will be for its bonds. 
you know, Qantas won't run out of money because of a recession, because actually typically what happens is, again, our dollar dies, more people come to the country, oil prices tend to be lower. A number of other factors will mean that the company will be fine. It just won't have growth in earnings. So the share price will fall, but the bonds will stay safe. Um, as we saw a couple of years ago when Qantas came out of its trouble, if you jumped into the shares then, um, I think at one stage you could get it below a dollar. You've done brilliantly. Hopefully there's a few people on the call who did exactly that. Um, and you're never going to make anywhere near those sort of profits on the bonds. I think a lot of our clients went into the bonds and it did well, um, but you're never going to double your money on, on bonds. So if you think it's looking really rosy, you buy the shares. If you're worried about the, the future risk, you buy the bonds. It's interesting with Qantas because they haven't paid a dividend for five years. So that that's, you know, but whereas if you're a, a bond investor, they always paid their, their coupons on their bonds. So, you know, that's the difference too. You get that out of protection with the bond. So if you're really reliant on the income or you want the income, yep. I think the bond's probably the better bet. And that's a great example because the Sydney Airport, um, the bonds and the shares actually from time to time pay the same income. Uh, but not every stock is like that. Qantas hasn't paid a divvy for years. Um, Newcrest uh, doesn't, I think, either has a very small dividend or doesn't have a dividend. So if you like Newcrest, substance, tick, like the company, but I need income. So I won't buy the shares, I'll buy the bonds. And sometimes you get that choice and sometimes you don't. And sometimes it works the other way. Telstra, um, every time I've ever looked at Telstra bonds, the income's awful because they're so popular. So, but the shares, relatively stable yeah they go up and down but relatively stable and the income's good so there's very rarely a chance to buy the, the a good time to buy the telstra bonds because it's just not great value but they also have that infrastructure link don't they you know the correct yeah. yeah so now we're down to number two um and it's probably fairly scary at this stage to say that the, the second worst risk for australian investors is a uh, it's a china hard landing uh, it'll make a lot more sense when i get to the next slide so we're dealing still with risks that are less than a 50% chance of happening. These are risks as opposed to what we think is going to happen. When we talk about a China hard landing, the term hard landing really means that the economy slows down too quickly. You know, imagine it like you're driving a car um, down your street and rather than slowly drop the speed before you turn into the driveway, you plow on the brakes, pull up the handbrake and skid into the driveway. One's a hard landing, it's uncontrolled, it's dangerous, and the other one is what you should do. The Chinese economy cannot keep growing at 7%. That's scary. It's a very large economy. Uh, it's about eight to 10 times the size of ours, and it's nearly the size of the US. So growing at 7% is frightening. We want it to slow so that it's controlled in percentage growth terms, um, but we don't want it to drop suddenly to two or 3%. That would be very bad. And that's what we call a China hard landing. Um, the impact on Australia would be severe, as bad, probably worse than a housing market crash. A really big part of our economy is now dependent on China. The probability um, was small, but certainly growing. Um, I don't think it's growing because of what happened to the equities market. It was growing. We, we said it was growing when we wrote the 2015 uh, Smart Income Report earlier this year. What's really happened with equity markets is they've finally come to the same realisation. There has been a risk for China for some time because of leverage, um, and they're struggling to make the transition from a construction infrastructure um, fixed asset driven economy, an investment driven economy to a consumer driven economy. They'll get that. If I can make an investment in China that I could put in the drawer and I never have to hear about its price day to day, and then 10 to 20 years I pull it out, that would be my favorite investment. But I can't make that one because it doesn't exist. I have to keep picking up the newspaper and finding out what's happened to it. Um, so it's going to be a scary ride um, for the nearer term. And um, it's not just about whether or not you're invested directly in China. If it's a scary ride uh, that the whole world is worried about, then Australian assets will be punished. Australia has become a bit of a proxy um, for emerging markets because we're a commodity driven economy. And all that really just goes towards is volatility, isn't it? You know, we're, we're expecting a more volatile global environment and, yeah. um, that we need to either defend or put more defensive assets into our portfolio or be happy with what we've got and, and watch the volatility or be happy to accept the volatility. To accept the volatility, that's right. The two, the two worlds should be separate. Traders and investment markets should be able to do their thing and buy and sell off each other madly on a day-to-day -day basis and high-frequency trading, all that sort of stuff. And the real economy continues on. And most of the time, they're separate. Where there's contagion between the two of them is if financial markets have too much volatility, 
and mum and dad investors get nervous and stop spending on the next car, the next couch, the next dress, that hurts the real economy. Then the real economy falls and then share markets fall further and you get into a cycle. And so that's what we mentioned before about the Fed in the US. That's why they're nervous about increasing rates right now mm -hmm. is because they don't want to create a, a bigger impact on confidence than what they might already be. Um, and that impact on confidence has actually come from the Chinese share market falling so heavily. There aren't that many people around the world who invest in Chinese equities directly. So it shouldn't be that big an impact, but it's the proverbial canary in the coal mine. It's interesting you're talking about confidence because we had a question from David and he said, do you regard the plethora or overload of financial commentary at present having any material adverse effect on investor confidence? Yeah, it, it's, I do. Uh, in short, I think it's having a major adverse impact um, and I'm um, quite critical about the uh, the commentary and it's not it's not the media per se. Half the time they're just reciting what, uh, what Wall Street is telling them and the other half the time is they're selling newspapers and so the headlines um, tend to be uh, far more, in a bull market, far more optimistic than they need to be and in a bear market like right now, um, far more pessimistic than they need to be. There was a quite a good piece actually written by, um, I, I won't try and get his name right, we've, I think we've just put it up on the wire, but he's the global um, uh, economist for uh, City, uh, and he's also part of, he used to be a part of the Bank of England's interest, setting, um, interest rate setting committee. And he's just come out with a view that he thinks there's a 55% probability, very specific number, um, that uh, the global economy will go into a recession next year. He didn't mean that the global economy will go into a recession next year. And that sounds strange given that's what he said, but economists have all these terms and jargon that they use um, that can be really confusing. He thinks that the global economy will fall to around about a 2.5% growth rate next year. Well, a growing economy is not a recession by, by the usual definitions. He calls it a recession because it's a big fall and it, the economy is underproducing by a substantial amount what it should be. So technically, in economics terms, you could call that a recession. Sadly, he put that in the headline. The global media, if you Google that, um, you'll find about 55 articles written with the headline, Senior Economist Calls Recession Globally. Right? And so that causes fear, which then hits markets, which then can hit the real economy. I'm very critical of that sort of thing. The Economist did the right thing. It's a really good piece of analysis. Um, sadly, he doesn't understand human nature and he put the headline saying 55% of the chance of recession. Uh, but he's really talking about this point here about China hard landing. He's saying um, that there's far too much capacity, too many empty roads, too many empty houses, too many empty factories uh, in China relative to the amount of demand for their goods and that there's going to be a very rapid slowdown in their economy for a few years and that'll hurt financial markets. Also sounds reasonable. I've got a, a question from uh, Rajesh who's asking where do you think all the growth is going to come from? All the Asian infrastructure um, assets are hugely debt ridden, Asian banks are sitting on huge uh, losses and have lost appetite for further lending. Who do you think will fund the growth? The, the Chinese government has fairly substantial um, cash reserves, so it's able to fund it from cash. Um, at the state level um, or the local level, hopefully they're not going to be borrowing money to build those infrastructure assets because mm -hmm. that would be concerning. Mm -hmm. The few that they've announced so far are um, funded at a national level. Mm -hmm. um, a number of Chinese Asian assets are heavily leveraged, but actually by and large most aren't. Yep. So um, private infrastructure around the world by and large is heavily leveraged, not in Australia so much, not in uh, the UK so much, but certainly in the US and the rest of Europe. China hasn't really done that so much so far, um, but you really don't want to see some of the local provinces start to do the big infrastructure spending um, that they were doing five or six years ago. I think at one stage in China, there were 120 airports being built at one time. All right, so that's uh, excess capacity. The size of it and the size of those empty apartment buildings is just, their whole city is it's yeah. unbelievable. Um, I've got a couple of other questions which we'll just sort of follow through. Um, I'll let you finish in a moment. Um, and I'm sorry if I pronounce your name incorrectly. 
Harmendra is asking, can energy hungry India provide a hedge against our exposure to China? It, it, great question because this has come up. I think we've now done um, about 10 or 12 of these seminars over the last month um, with these themes in it and that one has come up literally every single time. Uh -huh. um, and, and the following question being, how do I invest in India? Mm. Um, yes, India over the next 20 years is going to be a, a great hedge or buffer for China. We won't be as dependent on China. We'll also have India coming through. I say 20 years and not five because uh, having spent an enormous amount of time in India over the last decade, I think I've done about 28 trips um, to India. The infrastructure there is woeful um, and it is a democracy not like China, so they can't just go and move villages to build bridges and, and roads. Mm. Um, and so until they can get that infrastructure fixed, it's going to be a very slow recovery, which is what you tend to see. Every time there's strong growth, inflation kicks in because they can't move the goods around. You can't move food from um, A to B as fast as you need to to keep up with demand. So you'll get growth, inflation, growth, inflation, and it'll take longer to get there. Uh, 20 years from now, India will be fantastic. Australia, again, is really well positioned um, and keeping the environmental impact to the side for the moment. You've got coal and uranium um, as being India's two chosen ways of uh, producing energy. Well, we happen to have plenty of both of those. If we choose to sell it to them, we're really well positioned. Um, but that's not going to be a panacea for the next five years. In, in India is not going to be able to save us from a China hard landing. There's a couple of other questions, but I'll leave those till the end of the seminar that you wind up with number one. I'm sure everyone's waiting with bated breath. We've got a little bit to go on this okay. one, but, I, but I, will, um, I'll, I think I need to speed it up a little bit. Um, one of the concerns with China, obviously, is leverage. Um, and you know, in particular, if you look at the this chart now shows um, the amount of margin lending um, done there. Institutions, banks don't do margin lending. They lend money. They're happy to lend money, but they don't borrow money to buy stocks. Um, this is about the um, upper middle class, middle class China borrowing money. And to grow from $80 billion in um, July of last year to um, $500 billion at its peak in June of, of this year is phenomenal. Uh, if you borrowed money in July of last year to go into Chinese equities, you're still really well off, actually. You're about 25% up before the leverage, so probably 50% up if you geared. Uh, the scary part, though, is that most of that money was borrowed after January 2015, in which case you're, you're in the red and you've borrowed money to do that. Um, that amount of money relative to the size of the Chinese economy is not material. It's meaningful but not material, um, but it's the impact on confidence. So the middle class of China has been um, the great growth story for Australia. They're the ones who've been buying our products. Um, they're the ones who have been effectively buying our resources. And so if they stop buying, then it's a big concern for, for our economy. Um, this is just one small part of it. Imagine if the same thing happened with Chinese property and other Chinese assets and their confidence really started to get rattled, then, then we would have a big impact. So leverage um, is considered to be the biggest risk for China, and China is considered to be the biggest risk for the global economy right now. What do you do about that? Actually, so I got, uh, I'll just cover on this one quickly. You know, why is uh, Australia so dependent on China? We've actually, um, uh, you know, during the Chinese growth period over the last 20 years, um, we've done a fantastic job at capturing a large share of um, the export market um, from Australia into, into China, or capturing a large share of their imports. So we've gone in the last 10 years from $230 billion worth of exports in total to 360, 50% increase, fantastic. Uh, and most of that's come from the fact that we, we used to have 8.5% of our exports to China, now it's 32.5%. So we've really captured a lot of that. But it, it has squeezed out a number of other important trading partners. Um, and if China slows down, we need them. Mm. So if you look, for example, at uh, the US, we used to have nearly 10% of our exports um, going to the US, and now that's five. So it's nearly halved. Um, that's bad because actually the US, as I said at the start, is the world's strongest economy right now. It's the biggest and strongest. Um, South Korea we've kept up with, so that's okay. Japan we've kept up with, but we've managed to squeeze out some of our, uh, our old training partners like New Zealand, uh, the US and the UK, um, and that's going to cost us if China really slows down hard. 6% of our total GDP now comes from that 32.5% of exports to China. So if that was 
<coughs> excuse me, if that was to slow, um, that's why we, we take such a big hit. Massive. No one would want to take a 6% pay cut, so. No, no, that's right. Um, what do you do about that? Short Australian dollars, again, same thing. So we are a proxy for China GDP, for the Chinese economy. We're a very liquid uh, currency, so when currency traders get worried about China, they sell the Australian dollar. Uh, in the event of a China slowdown, the Reserve Bank would cut rates. So again, that's a good reason to, um, to sell down the Aussie. A sharp fall, a very sharp fall in China will again see the Aussie fall very steeply. You know, our base case on currency um, is 65 to 70 cents. We, we said that, or we started saying that August last year. Um, we're now into that. We've touched that a few times, and as we speak, it's still high 69s. But in this scenario, um, were a, a hard landing to ha happen, then you would see the Aussie fall to low 60s, high 50s. You would reduce equities, but this time, unlike when I talked about Aussie housing, um, if China has a hard landing, no equities will be safe to hide in. US equities, we've seen already, have a massive amount of volatility because they started to get worried about China. The US economy would be hurt, nowhere near as badly hurt as us, um, but it would take a hit, and that means that earnings growth for US companies, all companies around the world, would slow, um, and therefore share prices would fall. Um, so where do you hide? Obviously, you don't want ex uh, exporters either. Um, there's two things you can do in this scenario. Um, one is around currency. The other one to be to, to watch for, other than obviously just reducing risk in general, um, is if the Aussie dollar does fall that hard and that fast, uh, then we'll see inflation rise. And it'll rise in imported goods. Um, and mm -hmm. for uh, particularly for retirees, a lot of our pharmaceuticals come from overseas, a lot of the medical equipment comes from overseas, a lot of insurance comes from overseas. So the cost of living for retirees will increase even faster than the natural rate of CPI. Um, so inflation hedges, um, which really means infrastructure bonds, at this time, if you're worried about China, is a good idea. Now we have this thing called the short China portfolio, not terribly creative in its naming, um, but really the short China portfolio is that infrastructure bond portfolio I talked about before, um, which is really a, a safe harbour portfolio, but with an additional investment um, in foreign currency. Um, sadly, you can't buy foreign currency denominated bonds unless you're a wholesale qualified investor. But there's a lot of ways to buy foreign currency. You can go to Forex, you can buy beta shares, US dollar ETF. Um, there's a number of different ways to do that. Uh, but this is fixed, so we'll talk about it in bond terms. Um, the short China portfolio is a combination of a safe portfolio of infrastructure bonds, investment grade rated, not reliant on China or the economy, and foreign currency investment grade, preferably bonds, um, well diversified in US dollars and pounds. A lot of people ask me what's my favourite currency. Last August I said there's really only one currency to go into and that was the US dollar. Um, two or three months ago I started to say actually the pound is a good place to go as well. Um, the UK economy is in, in a good position. I think at that time we had just slipped through 50p. Um, we're now, I think, high 45s, low 46 is still good value. The point here, though, is you're short Australian dollars. You're not investing into US dollars or pounds because you love those economies. You just want to be out of the Australian dollar because if China crashes, the Australian dollar goes. So if you're going to go out of Australian dollars, where do you go? I'd be picking the pound of the US because they, they're relatively safe. But this chart um, has a lot of noise on it, a lot of squiggly lines. The red line is the currency. We've all seen that. It's down, uh, in fact, it's lower than this chart now shows. The blue line is volatility of our currency. Um, and interestingly, whenever we start to see a spike in that volatility, we drop through another step. So your last August, we started talking about um, that the Aussie was going to fall from its 94 cents against the US, we at that stage we said 70 to 75, um, and shortly after that we saw a drop because volatility was very high and it dropped down to high 80s, and then volatility calmed down. It sat in the high 80s for a while. Um, actually, at the time we changed our view to a 65 to 70 cent position um, for the Aussie. Volatility then picked up and down it goes again, and it fell to a new plateau and kicked around at low 80s for a while and then dropped to another level and another level and right now we're seeing it drop down to probably start to, to stabilise in the high 60s unless there's a really big shock to China. But that volatility right now in currency markets is very high. 
So, Craig, you're thinking that the dollar's getting close to where it should be, or you're thinking it might step down again? I think on our base case, which we'll get to on the next slide, I think on our base case, 65 to 70 is is a fair value. Um, you know, we tend to take very long-term views. We're looking again at fundamentals here, not at trading. Um, so, you know, a lot of the banks and fund managers will change their view week to week, month to month. Um, not really interested in, in in that game. For us, there was a, a big difference between fair value and where the Aussie was. It got back down to that um, 65 to 70. So it's the top end of that. It could go down a fair bit more. But if there were a hard landing in China, then that bets off. Mm -hmm. So if you see us change our forecast from the 65 to 70 zone to something lower, it's because we've got more worried about either Aussie housing or more likely China. Yeah. Um, the safe harbour portfolio, um, again, I'm going to come back to the chart here, so ignore that for the moment, but safe harbour portfolio really is um, much like the infrastructure bond portfolio from earlier um, and you know, a, a safer version of foreign currency bonds. So you could go into foreign currency bonds in high yield and earn a nice high um, income from um, riskier corporate bonds, you know, safe in the knowledge that, that a, a high yield bond is still safer than the, the uh, equity in the same company, um, or a safe harbour portfolio would go into high quality foreign currency denominated bonds, something that's say A rated or double A rated in US dollars or pounds. Um, and in fact, the um, pound corporate bond market has a lot of financial services senior bonds on it as well. So you tend to find a lot of um, great safe assets sitting in, in, in pounds. So then what you do is you take the credit out of the equation, the credit risk, yep. and you just, it is that true hedge against the currency. So. Exactly, yep. yep. Now I'll come back to this chart on the PE ratios because it is important. So we're under the number one risk. And after China, you'd have to be thinking, well, how, how could this one possibly be higher? Um, this to me is the biggest risk facing Australian investors, uh, mostly because its probability is high. Mm. So all of these risks are based on what's the impact, what's the probability, what's the time frame. I think this is an 80% probability because this is the base case. Uh, and, and it's because you know, we believe that the world economy in particular um, has got to a position where it's going to see lower GDP growth, lower economic growth for the next 10 to 20 years um, than we've seen over the last 10, 20, 30 years. And there's a number of factors driving that. Um, you know, I've got to um, sort of qualify that by saying actually generally I'm an optimist. I find myself in a very unusual position having you know, these sort of presentations now because by and large I'm, I'm biased on the positive side. So for me to make this sort of statement is, feels very out of character, but um, it's, there's too many fundamental factors driving um, a future scenario that looks, um, it's not bad, it's not a recession, uh, it's just mediocre. Uh, and and you know, those are, in the Western economies, baby boomers. They're retiring, so they're not going to be producing assets. And they actually spend less. People tend to spend less when they're retired than when they're when they're working. Um, you've got emerging markets simply cannot grow at the same rate that they have in the past. There is just not the capacity there. Um, and then you've got debt. As per one of the questions that was asked earlier, um, you know what good can come of these very very high debt ratios? Whether they're too high or not, it doesn't matter. We're all worried about them being high. So governments will spend less, which means less money going to the economies as well. So you've got three really long-term, 10, 20 year issues, all colliding with each other. Baby boomers in the Western economy is slowing down their growth potential. Emerging markets slowing down simply because they're starting to reach capacity themselves um, and the um, fiscal responsibility trend picking up. And it's hard to see any of them ending anytime soon. So um, the new mediocre is, is, uh, is actually a quote from Christine Lagarde, who's the um, managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, we call it the new normal. Um, whichever way you look at it, it means lower rates for a lower period of time, but more volatility because there's simply more money sloshing around looking for places to go to invest, and that's what we're seeing right now. There is a bias in, um, in financial markets uh, that's very natural. It's an optimistic bias. People, humans in general, like to look for the blue sky. They like to see the upside. Um, but I've never seen an outlook or a period of time like what we've seen for the last few years where year after year, people are overestimating how well the economy is going to grow. So on this chart, we look at the um, IMF's forecasts 
International Monetary Fund's forecast versus what actually happened. I've picked on the IMF here, not because they're bad, actually, they're one of the best forecasts, many, many worse. Um, but I've picked on them because they shouldn't have a bias. They're not making money by, by overestimating or underestimating an outcome. They should be completely unbiased. But for six years, they've got it pretty horribly wrong. 2009, they, at the start of the year, they forecast a 4.6% GDP growth globally. It came out at 42 So the following year, they thought, well, we'll just double down on that. Let's call it 46 again. No, 3.4. The next year, they went, well, we've got it wrong the last two years. Surely it has to catch up. Let's call it 47 Wrong again, 3.2. They're in a scenario where they're not able to, their models aren't able to tell them what's happening because they've got this collision of these three major factors all occurring at the same time. And they believe that QE, quantitative easing, or pumping money into economies by US at first, now Japan and Europe, they believe that QE was really going to have a much more immediate impact than it has had. And it hasn't. Um, so they've started to lower their forecast. In fact, now it's not at 4% where they uh, they forecast the start of the year. They've already dropped down to 36 for this year, and they'll be wrong again. And it's a concern when year after year that's happening. So it's telling us that um, the global economy is not as healthy as what we think it is, and there's something long-term driving that issue. This is not a normal sort of seven-year fixed cycle. This is a bigger cycle. So just a, a moment ago, you were talking about the <coughs> 10 to 20 years, this cycle. So is that sort of your time span for low interest rates? Is it, is it a 10 to 20 year? We're looking at much, much longer than anyone expects and that really we have to get our heads around very low rates for sort of 10 to 20 years. Is that your sort of cycle? Yeah, it's it's that's right. That's the base case. Mm. Um, and it's driven by, it's hard to see what's going to drive inflation up. Maybe in Australia it goes up a bit because of our currency, but we're a very small part of the world economy. Um, you've got three of the biggest economies in the world um, engaging in a currency war right now. They're trying to lower their currency so that their exports become cheaper. And they do that by lowering interest rates mm. or using QE. Mm. If they all do it at the same time, it's ineffective because they're competing with each other. Um, and it's also meaning that the US won't put interest rates up as much as they should because if they were to pump up rates by 1% or 2% and the rest of the world stay at zero, the US dollar will go through the roof and their exports will become very unpopular very quickly and slow their economy down. So they won't do that. It's a vicious cycle, isn't it? It is, it is. And, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, negativity and criticism about QE, um, and it's it's um, far too boring and far too complex to get into here. But the biggest criticism, I think, is what we're seeing right now is it's hard to pull out of. We, we've now become so addicted to quantitative easing and this liquidity um, that it's now proving very, very difficult to pull out of, and we're, we're actually creating a self-fulfilling prophecy of where now we have to have low rates or, you know, there's going to be too big a shock, which will actually force us to then have low rates. Um, just sort of, That sort of leads into a question from Courtney, who's holding quite a lot of cash in her self-managed super fund, and she's saying, well, what's the right time to buy? And, you know, what should I buy? She's obviously been looking from her, her question at um, at shares, Aussie shares, and uh, she's asking also about um, names that have exposure to the US in Australian dollars. So if you had any advice for someone holding a lot of cash and what to do with it, I mean, we've talked about in, inflation-linked bonds. That's yep. obviously an area where you think it's good to invest in. Um in terms of if she's a retail investor, I don't know, Courtney, if you are or not, but then she's not able to buy foreign currency bonds. Mm. One of the ETFs, one of the, um, you know, in US dollar ETF bond type. Yeah, there's a beta share. Of... Um, beta shares or beta shares, however you pronounce it, the yeah, US dollar ETF. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you don't get any interest on it because there's no interest rates in the States right now and it pay, you pay a very small fee, but it's an easy way to get exposure to US dollars. Um, unhedged in, um, international share funds, unhedged international bond funds. Um, there's a range of different ways to do that. Um, you can't just go and open up a US dollar bank account, and you wouldn't because it's very expensive to yeah. do, but the other ways all work. Um, in terms of when you go into equities, they call it the um, trying to catch a falling knife. And you can imagine the imagery of that. Uh, if you grab it too soon, you cut your fingers off, um, catch it too late, and it's already hit the ground. So. It's hard to pick the bottom of, of a market like this mm -hmm. um, and then you get into personal advice. Mm. Um, you know, if, if, if you're of an age where actually you can't afford to lose more of your wealth than shares, not as good an idea than if you're younger um, and you can get in. 
what um, what I can say um, is that for the first time since the mid 80s, I'm out of shares. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've not been out of the share market for all that time. And it's not because I'm worried about the share market or I don't like it. It's that it's it feels like there's going to be a great time to buy sometime mm -hmm. in the next 12 months. So, mm -hmm. but I want it to fall and have that cash on the sidelines. We talk about with this risk, um, which is the new normal. Um, that cash, if you're reliant on the income from cash, which I'm not because I've still got a job, um, if you're reliant on the income from cash, that's a bad investment strategy because if for 10 years um, you're going to see interest rates at this level or lower and you're hoping it's going to bounce back, we just don't think it is. So relying on cash is not the thing to do. Sitting on cash temporarily because you're waiting for a good time to jump in, um, I can't say that's a bad idea because that's what I'm doing. Um, now, on this slide, we've, we've got uh, PE ratios for the US market. Again, really messy slide. Um, I just want to make one quick point on it, which is long-term PE ratios, which is the price to earnings ratio. Um, if a company makes a dollar and it's got a share price of $10, you're paying $10 to buy $1 of earnings or a 10 PE ratio. The higher the PE ratio, the more expensive. Um, it's a bit like a um, rental property yield. The lower it falls, the more expensive effectively it is. So um, when PE ratios are high, we say stocks are expensive. Right now, long-term PE ratios, even taking into account bond yields, um, in the US are at very high levels, despite the pullback in, in the last month. We've only seen them at these sort of peaks um, three times before, 1929, 1999, and 2007. Sorry, Craig, I've just had a question from David. He's wondering the time scale on the graph. He can't quite read the year. So oh. are those peaks at the at the recessions, you know, the peak recessions? Uh, just, well, the, the recessions were just after. Sorry, so it's, um, I'm not sure what's happened to the date. So that's 1900. The very left-hand side is the year 1900 and the very right-hand side is now, August 2015. Right, so very long term. 115 years worth of data. So that first big spike in the light blue line is 1929. So the P ratio at that time uh, went way past these current levels. So there still could be plenty of money to be made from share markets based on, on that historic measure and came down even harder. And then we had, um, if you bought in at um, you know sort of 1930, then it took you 25 years to get your money back. Um, and then again, we had, um, when we went through the 1999 spike, the, the um, big um, NASDAQ boom, it went all the way to 44, a P ratio of 44. And then it came down very hard after that. So there's um, a long way it can go up in a bubble, but you are at historically very expensive levels. So US equities really concern me right now because of this reason. Mm -hmm. The only way that this P ratio can be justified is if earnings were to increase quite dramatically. And, you know, the US economy is doing well, but not great. Good, but not great, as Buffett said. So it's hard to see how you're going to get extraordinary earnings growth in a moderate, mediocre economy. Um, so US equities, um, to me, not a great place to hide right now for that reason. Well, that's actually the, the darker blue line, isn't it? And that's getting up towards that, that it's surpassed, you know, the S&P 500 index has surpassed all, all, all other levels. So... A steep climb often, you know, precedes a, a steep fall. That's right. Yeah, when we look at P ratios, because the the S and P index is always going to go up because the you know, the economy is getting bigger, companies are getting bigger. Um, so the ratio, the the light blue line is it's it's like a rental yield on property. Is five hundred thousand dollars expensive for a property? Well, tell me what the yield is, and I'll tell you whether or not that's expensive. The S and P at two thousand is that expensive? Well, I don't know. What's the earnings ratio? Uh, 27 times long-term earnings ratio, that's expensive. So right now it's actually pulled back a bit, so it's around sort of 24 or so. Um, that's still a long way above the average in the long term, which is more like sort of 14 or 15. Mm. That would imply a Dow of about 11,000, not 16,000 at the moment. For bonds, mediocre is good. Um, and in particular, when we have this persistent optimistic bias, so much like the IMF chart I showed before, this chart is Wall Street's forecast of US 10-year bonds at the start of each year and the actual by the end of that year. The lighter blue is their forecast at the start of the year and the actual is the 10-year bond rate by the end of the year. Since 2004, 
They've got it wrong in the same direction every single year. Now, remembering this is Wall Street. So Wall Street is paid more if equities go up than if they go down. It's hard to do an IPO. It's hard to do investment banking in a falling market. So they are naturally biased to forecasting a positive economic outlook because that means that equities earnings will go up. Um, and if an economy is looking stronger, that actually means um, that bond yields will also go up. Mm. And so year after year, they've been far too optimistic um, and sometimes quite dramatically so. Uh, and so at the start of this year, there was a forecast for US bonds um, to be 10 year bonds to be over 3% by the end of the year. Uh, they're at 2.19 at the moment. There's very little chance that they'll wind up uh, anywhere near that forecast. Uh, and you know, in our view, that as we talked about with the global economy being much slower for much longer and the Fed being in a position where it can't put up rates too high without killing its export markets, we actually think that long-term bonds should be much more like 1.5 or 1.7%. So in answer to the question earlier about you know, where do you put your money other than in cash right now, uh, with bond yields at these sort of levels, uh, you're getting good value, you're getting better yield. And if they were to fall to um, the sort of levels that even uh, uh, the market in general thinks they will, um, but if they were to fall to the sort of levels that we believe that they should be at, um, then you'll make small gains from that, but you'll also get your income. And I emphasize small because you don't invest in bonds for massive capital gains. It's just that it's a good, you're getting good income right now if you can get in. That yield on US and Australian uh, bonds has really jumped around a lot in the last couple of months. Yeah. So coming back to our core theme, buy on the fundamentals, uh, or choose what you want to buy on the fundamentals and pick the timing based on the fear and greed cycle. Right now, there's a lot of fear and greed. So some days you get great value, the next day you don't. We were at the US 10-year um, bond level was at 1.95 only three weeks ago. Now it's at 2. Uh, one night. So in other words, you're getting 24 basis points, 0.24% more over a whole 10 year period, um, but exactly the same risk, it's simply because the market changes its mind. But it's a 10% change in two weeks. Yeah. So no wonder the traders are happy. Volatility is good for them. And so for longer term investors, pick your strategy and then you know, talk to someone who watches the market um, minute by minute mm -hmm. to understand when the right time is to jump in. I've got a few other questions here. Do you want to finish off and then we'll go to the questions? Yep. So um, these themes actually we've already had on a number of the others. The short AUD came up on a number of the big risks, but this is the base case. So now we're talking about what we think is an 80% chance of happening. This is the norm um, and not surprising we've got short AUD on there because we've been calling for a falling Aussie for, for some time. Um, so it's the right place to be if you believe that this is the base case and it's the right place to be if you think some of those other less likely shocks were to happen as well. Um, in this scenario though, you reduce US equities. They are priced for perfection. We saw that on one of the previous slides. If they were to come back to normal levels, it's a 20 or 30% drop. Um, yeah, should you be in Chinese equities, it's a similar story. Uh, EU and Aussie equities actually are at reasonable values. Uh, I'm not buying at this stage because it's just reasonable. And if the US did fall that much, there's not much we can do about seeing our market fall as well. Then there's good value. Uh, but right now, um, you know, some of the commentary around about Australian equities being expensive, I'm not, I'm not believing that one. Actually, they're at reasonable value. Some sectors, the banks are still pretty expensive. Some sectors are, but by and large, it's all right. Um, there's not a lot of value in short duration government bonds. You're barely getting paid what you would for your cash, so why bother? Um, ETFs, exchange traded funds and, and passive uh, managed funds, those who follow an index, um, will have very high allocations to these, so mm. not a great time to be there. Um, in this scenario, you increase corporate bonds. Why? Well, in a flatter economic scenario, earnings growth is lower. That means that um, share prices are harder to justify and tend to be either flat or falling, whereas corporate bonds in a mediocre environment, um, the economy is okay. It's just beige, it's boring. Right? And so um, cash is there, corporate bonds will pay all their coupons and repay their capital. Um, and so in those environments, actually, it tends to outperform uh, equities. Reduce reliance on cash. This is the point I made before. I don't rely on cash, so I can sit in cash for a short while. Don't sit in cash for 10 years if you need it to pay the bills. And hedge against inflation, we've, we've covered already. 
Um, I think we'll, we'll better head into the wrap up. So if you've got we a few are. more questions. We've, we've gone well over time. So sorry about that, but we'll ask a, a couple of quick questions. Um, where are we? What is um, Craig's view on the risk of deflation in Australia and the US? That's um, asked by Anthony. Um, US inflation, really hard to see how that's going to occur. Really hard to see. There's a lot of deflationary pressures around the world. Um, those three big economies I mentioned before, uh, Japan, China and the EU, uh, despite the fact that the US is massive, they swamp it. Right? So the EU and China are nearly the same size as, as the US. Uh, and so when they start exporting deflation, which means they're trying to push down their currencies and then export goods into the US, it keeps a lid on inflation for the US. Australia's inflationary risk is all about its currency. Um, you know, for hard goods, the things we import the most, the electronics and so on, um, we'll definitely see inflation. Um, for others, we won't. The only thing that could shock world inflation is oil. Mm. Uh, but the, right now, the world has a lot more oil capacity than it has demand. China's been a big part of the demand. That's not going to come back um, dramatically. Um, and there is literally a capacity war going on between the US, who won't back down because they want to be independent. And finally, they've got a chance to be independent, compliments of shale, um, and OPEC, who won't back down because they don't back down. So you know, right now, there's a lot of capacity with oil. Um, it's not going to go back up $60, $70 anytime soon. So inflation risk, um, I think it's an Australian issue. I think it's a longer term issue. Um, the reason I like the infrastructure bonds as an inflation hedge is you're really not paying that much for the hedge. No. You're getting good income. If there is no inflation, mm. um, you just get better income if there is. Some of those margins are very much like the term deposit rate, so yeah. it's like a free inflation yeah. hedge. I agree. Um, just one last question from Courtney. She asks, so is the US um, looking like China, expensive then a, then a crash? It won't be anywhere near as severe as China. China's crash was driven by, um, actually it looked a lot like the 1999-2000 the US tech wreck. Um, you remember when we were buying stocks because um, companies had more eyeballs. We didn't even know what that meant. We just bought them because it had more eyeballs, apparently, and that was a great thing, more clicks. And um, and so the, they just went, it, the, the um, irrational exuberance went out of control. China is much the same. So it was the mums and dads finally given access and given margin lending. Um, they doubled up. It became literally like um, going to the TAB and betting on horses. Um, the US is not like that. No. But... The US has got um, addicted to QE, cheap cheap debt, uh, and that's at an institutional level. So with rising rates, the big concern is that that um, slow release of the bubble will cause um, prices to come down. If it's mm. if people get too scared too quickly and hit the panic button, then you'll get a crash. But it won't be 50% like, like China has been. Um, it'll be 20%. Okay, do you want to just summarise um, your thoughts for everyone? Because we, we've covered a lot today and I think it's been fantastic. But perhaps if you can just give us a, a very brief summary uh, and then we'll, we'll finish. So I'll just finish with this, um, with this slide. You know, uh, economists try very hard not to give you sp specific numbers. I tend to break that rule a lot. Um, the new mediocre or the new normal to me is the base case scenario. Mm -hmm. Give it an 80% likelihood. Um, and, and in that scenario, rates... Um, in Australia and the US, UK, uh, the long rates, I mean, um, are not justified. So, so markets are pricing 10-year bonds, whether you're talking about government or corporate, they're basing, uh, pricing those bonds at, at higher yields um, than what we believe we're going to see. And that's because of this persistent optimism, human nature, Wall Street-driven optimism about recovery, that if they haven't seen from getting it wrong for 10 years yet, there's some naivety going on. Mm -hmm. We believe eventually um, uh, that markets will catch up with that. Now, we started the year by saying we thought um, that the year was going to be about emerging markets in China and the concerns there that the Aussie dollar would eventually fall down into the 70s, um, that US rates would fall. Um, and so these are the same sort of themes. You just don't know is it going to happen next month or the month after. Um, but we strongly believe that over the next six months, 12 months, 18 months, bond yields will fall. And that means if you're holding them right now, you're getting more income than will you than you will if you buy in in 12 months' time. Mm -hmm. um, 
The US um, interest rate cycle will start in, de in December, won't go for long. They'll put up rates maybe three, four, five times, maybe get into one, one and a half percent, and then it'll end because no one else will be increasing rates. Um, so they don't want to kill their, their export market. Um, a hard landing, that 30% probability there is um, what we believe at the moment. It's unfortunately going the wrong way. Probability is getting higher and higher. Citigroup said 55%. Um, who's right, who's wrong, we don't know. But it's the point is it's getting worse. And as Australians, that's bad. There's no good. There's nothing good about that. No. Downturn is the less likely of all those scenarios. Um, luckily, the hedges against the downturn are actually more or less the same as the hedges against China falling. So if you believe either of those scenarios or both, um, then the way to uh, protect yourself against that is go into more like uh, infrastructure bonds. Uh, and the way to profit from it is to go short the Australian dollar. Thank you so much, Craig. I really appreciate you giving your time today and to, to help um, everyone understand some of the risks out there and some of the courses of action they can take to help protect their portfolio. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I hope you've learnt uh, quite a lot. We certainly have. Uh, good afternoon. This now concludes the presentation.